We began with this series two weeks ago, introducing it as a series about the revival of the Ummah. And part of it, we break it down into three different areas. Amongst them is the individual self. What are the traits that you need as an individual to succeed from the Islamic perspective? And how does this relate to the overall societal success, the impact that you have as an individual with these characteristics? on society, on family, on organizations, and on the ummah in general. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us success and victory at the individual, family, and societal level. Allahumma ameen. We began with the topic of sincerity, ikhlas, two weeks ago. Last week we covered which topic? Iman. iman. You guys were ready for the question this time. We covered the topic of iman. What is iman? The components, the pillars, how to revive it, the blessings of iman as well. Today we are covering the logical sequence when a person has now the foundation of sincerity and there's belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we defined iman as something that is internal and external so the internal is the belief and the external affirms or confirms rather what you believe so there has to be some action and what action will we begin with other than as-salah the prayer something that the sahaba would hear about their entire lives and never get bored of it Something that the scholars would say, we are always in need of being reminded about the quality of salah, the blessings of salah, the virtues of salah. It is the topic that if you look at the concept of success from the Quranic lens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the answers to all the questions. It's an open book exam. And with that, one of the defining characteristics of Islam, one of the main traits, in fact, the main physical pillar of Islam, once you believe, once there's shahada, is salah. And sometimes we overlook it because we've heard about it or know how to pray or we have studied maybe the rulings, the fiqh of prayer. So we move on and sometimes it becomes robotic. For many Muslims it becomes just a physical thing. For other Muslims they may admit and say, listen, I know salah is important, but sometimes I feel like it's a burden. Many Muslims will admit this is how they actually feel. They'll do it. They know it's important. It is correct. You can't abandon it no matter what. But they'll say, I, don't, I want to enjoy the salah more. And I feel like I used to enjoy it. Or maybe sometimes I enjoy it. What can I do? What is it that we can talk about? Let's set the scene by going to the end of the life of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every time we hear his blessed name, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A few days before he died, Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave advice about many different topics. And you and I know that when someone is at the end of their lives, the advice that they're giving, you don't have much time. So the advice that they're giving is very important advice to pay attention to. And also, it's very important from their perspective. So there's only so much that could be given as advice at the end of his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 23 years of being a, a, a prophet, of spreading the message, of reminding the companions, of being kind to the old and the young, men and women. And the Prophet Sallallahu one of the final pieces of advice he gives, As-Salah, As-Salah, the prayer, the prayer. Meaning, take care of your prayer, take care of your prayer. Why is it so important in Islam? Why is it that we hear about it our entire lives and we, we sense from the many narrations that it is extremely important in Islam? The Prophet Sallallahu describes the effect of Salah in this life on your situation in the next life. So on the day of judgment, there's a very vivid description of what happens. And, and this is actually uh, unique to Islam, how much detail we have about the day of judgment. And one of the stations we will all have to go through. Doesn't matter old and young, one station that everyone has to go through. So you have to pass through, you have to be able to walk through with a record. Now, those who died before, for example, the age of accountability, they're not held accountable. But the scholars say the, the direction that everyone has to walk through is the same. Muslims and non-Muslims, good and bad. Everyone have to cross over the hellfire as well. The Prophet ﷺ mentions all these stations. And amongst them is the station in which the believers who are given a very light questioning. Not the actual accountability where every deed is judged. The light skimming of deeds. yasira in the Quran. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked about this. Hisab and Yasira is not a deep, detailed questioning. For those believers who have a very light skimming of their deeds, like very fast, very quick. And of course, uh, quick, uh, we don't know exactly what this means, but this is, we leave this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the things that we do know is that the believers will be asked first about their salah, the prayer. Of all the acts of worship, 
The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the end of his life is reminding about it. Now if someone had gaps, shortcomings, sometimes you pray and you're not fully focused. Sometimes you feel like your salah wasn't the best salah. So the nawafil, the voluntary, optional prayers that you pray during the day and throughout the week and throughout the year, these are prayers that are like extra credit that you are in need of. This is not like a class where you can get like, you know, sometimes in school, if you have so much extra credit given out, you have like 140% in the class. You're like, wow, like this is such an easy class. This is the type of extra credit that we are in need of because of how many shortcomings we have in salah. Because how many times we've slacked off with salah. So when we talk about salah, there are many people who hear the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Give us comfort by calling to the prayer, O Bilal. Bilal was the mu'adhin. So give us tranquility through the salah, O Bilal. Start the adhan in other words. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam therefore saw the prayer as a form of tranquility, as a source of peace. So if we find that we are praying and there's zero peace, there's zero tranquility, that means we might be missing something really important in how we are praying. And I don't mean in the how in the sense of fiqh, like how do I raise my hands? How do I stand? How do I bow down? These are things we have to learn. There's a minimum level of knowledge for all of us to learn, but it's more of like the why. Why is this so amazing, this act of worship, this slila with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Many Muslims complain of feeling a lack of motivation. They see it as something difficult to feel motivated about salah. And other people say, I feel like I'm doing all my prayers, so I'm in a good place. But they're flying through the salah, and when you ask, they'll say, I don't actually feel like I'm taking anything from salah. Like I'm doing it, ibadah, check it off your list. To-do list, it's done. Obligations, I did them. Internal state was not affected at all. Something is missing. Something very crucial is missing. So the salah, we know, it has its fixed times, the beginning and the end times for every single prayer. And oftentimes, when we receive advice or somebody sends you a video or you listen to a lecture or you read a book about salah, sometimes one of the tricks of shaitan, the devil will come to us and make us think, what? At least I pray. I know someone who doesn't pray. At least I'm praying my five prayers. So and so doesn't even pray. Why compare ourselves to someone who is not as practicing externally, as far as we know, externally? Why, why compare yourself to someone who is not praying? Compare yourself to someone who's praying more. Like maybe I can be better. So we should always be looking ahead as the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Let's start from the beginning of the Mus'haf. We have the first surah of the Qur'an as you're reading in terms of the order. The first surah is Surah Al-Fatiha. And then you have Surah Al-Baqarah. In the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, you have the opening verses. And in these opening verses, Alif Lam Mim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه. This is the book, there's no doubt regarding it. Look how bold it is. Hudan lil muttaqin. It is a guidance for those who are conscious of Allah, mindful of the rights of Allah. And the very first characteristic mentioned in the next ayah of any verse of the Quran, this is what Allah decided would be at the beginning. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to read as soon as we started Surah Al Baqarah. What is the next ayah? Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. The believers, al-muttaqin, hudan lil-muttaqin, who are they? They are those who believe in al-ghayb. We had an entire khutbah here about the topic of al-ghayb, belief in the unseen. It's justified rationally, but it's unseen in terms of the physical, in terms of the empirical. But you know it's there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs you about it, and you have reason, therefore, justification to believe in it. The believers, they, they believe in the unseen things. This includes the malaika, this includes life after death, this includes qadr as it comes down, your fate, your decree. This includes many things. And right after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what? So, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ And then what? وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ The scholars say this is not unintentional. Everything in the Qur'an is very intentional and precise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms that the very first physical manifestation of your iman, the very first sign of your taqwa that is external. Now, you believe internal بالغيب. That very first external deed is that you pray. Your salah. This is a proof of what there is internally. And this is a reminder for us of how crucial it is that to your Iman you will find a link with your Salah. With your Salah you will find a link to your Iman. Strengthen your Iman, you will find that you will strengthen your prayer. Strengthen the quality of your Salah, you will notice your Iman also increasing. They are intertwined in many different ways. And this is one very practical way for us to improve the state of our prayers. We know the story of how the Prophet ﷺ migrated والسلام, and when he gets to Medina, one of the first things he says, when the people gather, imagine all these people are gathering, many of them are meeting him for the first time ﷺ, and there are some non-Muslims in attendance. 
the very first thing he advises amongst the pieces of advice, and of course there are many statements, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ayyuhan nas, afshu salam O people, O mankind, O humanity, O people, afshu salam This is the message of Islam summarized in a few components. Spread the, the, the greeting of peace. Afshu salam وَأَطْعِمُ الطَّعَمُ Feed those who are in need of food. Feed others. وَصِلُ الْأَرْحَامُ Uphold the ties of family. Do not be amongst those who break up families. Do not be amongst those who justify not reaching out, not fixing, not correcting a very difficult relationship. And the Prophet ﷺ said, وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامُ Pray at night while people are asleep. تَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ بِسَلَامُ You will enter paradise in peace. Look at the different components of this primary advice. He enters Medina sallallahu alayhi wa and he only gives four pieces of advice. There's no complicated da'wah here. It's not a complex philosophy. There's nothing intricate that even a child, a Bedouin, a Jew, a Christian could understand what the message of Islam was. In short, spread the greeting of peace, afshu salam, feed those who are in need. So Islam has a huge component of helping other people in society. Islam has the component of upholding the ties of family and relatives. And this is extremely important, especially today when families are broken up. And I don't mean a family, I mean generally as a societal trend that it's so easy and so common to find estranged family members cutting each other off over very petty things. And I'm not talking about severe situations, but rather the default. And then there's prayer. Prayer between you and Allah when no one is watching. Why? Why this salah in particular is mentioned here? Well, the salah that you're praying in jama'ah, the salah during the daytime, it's important. It's an act of worship. But... There is some element of it that sometimes people can witness, can see in you. So the sign of sincerity is that if you're pushing yourself with sincerity, pray at night when no one is watching. It's you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And while people are asleep, meaning what? It's not an easy act of worship. You're standing, you're sacrificing sleep for the sake of your Lord. All of these components have obviously, these are umbrellas. They all have their, their subtopics, if you will. This is the, the formula to paradise, the rights of Allah the rights of the creation, uphold the ties of family. We look at the definition of salah. There are many things to say about it, but just so we understand the, the, the word itself, the root of it, comes from multiple connotations. Amongst them, saliya, uh, which means to burn something. This is one of the meanings the scholars say, the, the scholars of uh, language. It means to burn something, meaning what? Like a furnace. So salah, as you go through it, you are burning away your sins. You're purifying your heart. You're getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're being sincere as well. So you come out more pure. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave the example with the companions when he said, think of a person, take the example of a person who takes a bath in the running river five times a day. Will you find dirt on this person? So if you have soil, dirt, your feet are very dirty from walking and so on and so forth. If somebody is taking a, basically a bath or a shower five times a day, do you think you're going to find a lot of dirt on this person? They said, no. The Prophet ﷺ said, this is the example of your five daily prayers. But it's not purifying here the external. The wudu is, the salah is purifying your internal. The salah is purifying your heart even if you don't feel it in the moment. There is a purification process. The other word that's related is silah. The entirety of salah is what? Many times non-Muslims ask us, what is prayer in Islam? Tell us about your prayer. So the word prayer in English can mean many different things. Usually when, when people use this word prayer, they mean a supplication, pray to God. They mean what we think of when we say dua. But for us, salah has a very technical definition. But within salah, what is it? Aside from the recitation of Quran, the entirety of your salah is a, a series of supplications. Dua after dua after dua, or dhikr after dhikr after dhikr. So it's all your remembrance of Allah. And it's a conversation. You're calling upon Allah in every part of the salah. And you are, of course, starting with a state of physical purification. You enter the salah with takbir, exemplifying or, or uh, emphasizing the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now you are focused on that which is great rather than this world and rather than our distractions. And it ends with taslim. And everything in between is a type of silah, connection. So the question for us is, if we go into salah, and our perspective is not, this is a connection between me and Allah. Are we going to get anything out of it? Well, this is why many people feel as they fly through the salah, then they complain and say, I didn't get anything out of it. I don't feel anything in it. Well, what do you think salah is? What did you put into that conversation between you and Allah? Was your mind present or was it wandering? Were you focused on what you recited or you distracted? 
Are you just reading the same thing every single time? Are you just becoming, it's becoming like a robotic ritual? You just say it and you move on? It's just a physical movement, you don't think twice about it? One example of this, uh, one of our uh, friends, uh, one of the mashaykh, he gave this example. You know where your house is if you've been living in the same place for a long time. You know how to get home from different places. So generally speaking, as you're driving home, you could possibly be distracted in terms of, let's say, someone's talking to you. But you don't get lost because of how much you've memorized this path. It's become mundane, a routine. It's very easy for you. But what happens when you're driving somewhere new? There's a detour. There's a roadblock. The GPS now, now you have to turn on the GPS. What happens if someone's now distracted? You're like, hold on, hold on. Somebody calls you. Oh, hold on, hold on. I, I'll call you back. Why? Because you're no longer dealing with what is routine. You're dealing with something new. So now you're more focused. Sometimes with regards to focus in salah, sometimes we need to shatter a routine that has become dry, a routine that has no heart present anymore. And one of the, there are many ways to do that. We'll talk about them inshallah ta'ala. But one of the ways to do that is to switch up some of the dua you're making in sujood. To change the surah that you're reciting. Don't keep reading the same surah in every single prayer. And if that's all you've memorized, what should this do? Inspire you to memorize more. Inspire you to learn some of the athkar that you can say in ruku' and sujood other than only subhana rabbi al-a'la and subhana rabbi al -Azim. So this will inspire us to break the routine and focus more on what we are saying. This is one advice that many scholars have given. How many times approximately is salah mentioned in the Quran? Around 70 times. And there are many examples, many contexts. رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَىٰ And of course, with these examples, you even have references to specific types of prayer. Some of these we'll learn about in fiqh of salah classes, perhaps. Maybe in the future we'll have an entire series just on the fiqh of salah, inshallah ta'ala. The example of this in the Qur'an is you have uh, the traveling prayer uh, for uh, those who are traveling. You have salat al-khawf, uh, the prayer of fear. You have uh, salat al-jum'ah mentioned in the Qur'an, surah al-jum'ah as well. You have the congregational prayer reference in the Qur'an. You have the night prayer mentioned in surah al-isra. You have the five prayers mentioned in different contexts, in different ways, and the t that there is a timing for these prayers. But the context is not always the actual salah. Sometimes salah is used to refer to a dua. وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ صَلَاتَكَ سَكَنٌ لَهُمْ Pray upon them. It doesn't mean pray. It means make dua for them. Supplicate for them. It also could mean your religion, your deen. أَصَلَاتُكَ تَأْمُرُكْ They would say to one of the Prophet, does your prayer, meaning your deen, your religion, command you to say such and such or do such and such? So it has multiple meanings in the Qur'an. So when we say salah, it has all of these connotations. But usually, in everyday conversation, when someone says salah, we generally mean the act of worship that begins with takbir, takbiratul ihram, and ends with taslim. And the Prophet wasallam. this is one of the prophecies. Over a hundred prophecies came true already. Prophecies in the sense of knowledge of the future that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. وسلم, many of them fall under the topic of signs of the Day of Judgment. Some of them took place at the time of the Sahaba, some after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, some in the last 1400 years, and some will take place in the near future, and Allah knows best, and some will take place at the very end of times. In one of the reports, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, the very first thing that will be lost of your religion is khushu' to focus. And khushu' here, the scholar said khushu' in salah especially, because in the Quran, khushu' is usually linked with prayer. Khushu' is the first thing that will be lost of the religion and the last thing is salah. So the salah will become a shell. Meaning what? The physical prayer is there, but the first thing to disappear is not the prayer itself, but a part of the prayer which is to focus, to be humbly submissive to Allah. And then, and perhaps there might be a person praying with no goodness in them, but there will come a time where you enter a masjid for a congregational prayer and you don't see a single person with khushu'. So one of the reports that goes back to Hudayfa radiallahu an, this is something they learned, the Sahaba learned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For us, let's look at some of the fada'il, some of the virtues, some of the blessings to remind us. We'll try to mention maybe 10 of them uh, if we have time inshallah ta'ala. Number one, salah is the right of Allah upon us. So Islam goes back to rights, first and foremost at its foundation, rights. And when we talk about rights, you can't possibly claim to fulfill the rights of people without knowing what their rights are, who defines what is a right. So from our worldview, rights are defined by Allah. Sometimes people say, this is my right, or this is your right. Who defines what is a right? Now, yes, there's a legal system. That's a different context. We're talking about the worldview, the religious. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and has a right upon us. 
And that right is that we worship Him alone. And we worship Him on His terms, not ours. We worship Him in times of ease and difficulty. May Allah protect us from difficulty. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing that He is deserving of our worship and alone deserving of our worship. So this all goes back to who is Allah and who are you to Him. One time a young student came up to me in Minnesota and it was after I gave a lecture on belief in Allah and uh, doubts and atheism and things like this. Long story short, he said, listen, I have a problem, a struggle. I think he was a college student at the time or he had just started college. He said, I don't like following rules. That's my problem. I was, I, that's just my personality. I was born this way. I was raised this way. I don't like rules at all. So I don't like people to tell me to pray. I don't want to pray. I don't want to fast. I don't like rules. And I asked him a couple of questions amongst them. I said, are you a criminal? He said, what do you mean? So like, have you been convicted of a crime? I said, no. I said, why? So I, I'm not going to commit a crime. So do you drive? Yes, I just started driving. Excellent. Okay, you drive to class, to school, to your, your friend's house, to the masjid. He's like, I drive. I said, do you intentionally break the law when you drive? Do you speed a lot? Do you do this and that? He's like, no, no, I, I don't have any tickets. I'm like, do you think speeding might be fun for some people in their minds? Like, oh, I'd love to speed. It's exhilarating. He's like, yeah, but I, I don't want to get tickets. My parents will kill me. I said, oh, okay, okay. So there's some rules. Are you, you go to school? Yes. All right. You, you cheat on your exams? No, no, no. Oh, why? I don't want to get kicked out of school. Do you play any sports? I play basketball. Oh, awesome. Okay. Do you like it when the, the person you're playing against is cheating all the time? They're traveling all the time and so on and so forth? I said, no, of course not. We sometimes we get into fights when somebody accidentally you know, does something like that. I said, listen, you like rules. You follow all the rules. The only rules you are saying you don't actually like are limited to the domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rules. You gave the word rules a negative connotation with Allah only. But when it came to every other part of your life, you know that without rules, first of all, people are not deterred. Second of all, without rules, there's chaos. Third of all, without rules, there are, there's injustice in society, in your sports, in your school. So you don't break any rules, mashallah. But the only thing you see as a restrictive, negative type of rule is the revelation of Allah. And this is because of some impression you have of who God is. If you think of salah as a restriction rather than a liberation, it's going to seem difficult, but here's the thing. I told him, I know some college students, they've come and they've said, listen, I know Islam is true. I went through all the different studies. I know what atheism is and I know Islam is true. I'm convinced. But they said, I struggle with salah, meaning my body does not enjoy the prayer because I have to pray five times a day. I have to pray fajr on time. Isha sometimes is late, but I will never leave prayer. This is the difference between somebody, this is obviously not the best example, but this is the difference between somebody who says, listen, what's revealed is true whether you like it or not. Now, if you want to enjoy it, there are certain things that will help you to enjoy salah. Amongst them is to know who Allah is and why He gave us prayer. Amongst them is to know why you were created. One of the best things, one of the youth told me this helped him, shaped him for the rest of his life, is the thought that I was created for this. Every time you're about to pray, this is what I was created for. We weren't created for a full-time job. We need a full-time job to survive. You weren't created for worldly entertainment. Well, sometimes we need to relax. You weren't created for eating. You eat to survive. Some people say, no, I, I, I do the opposite. The reality is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you to know Him, to worship Him, to do the best you can do. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala And أَحْسَنُ has to be defined. It is defined by Allah. And it starts with salah. That's the first. So it's a part of humility. Number two, it's that, it, it, it is that salah is the best act of worship after shahada, after you become Muslim. And how many times have many people in our community here and everywhere else embraced Islam and one of the first things they said, teach me how to purify myself and how to pray. The very first thing you teach a new Muslim, who is Allah, yes, they've, they've been learning, now they know this is the truth, now they become Muslim, what's next? Before you throw like the entire book at them, no, you're going to teach them the very first, most important thing, connection to Allah. Sila. It is Salah. Mu'ad radiallahu an was sent to the people of Yemen. And when he was sent to the people of Yemen, he was told once they say, La ilaha illallah, teach them a Salah. Teach them how to pray. In the beginning of Surah Al-Mu'minun, there's a beautiful formula. A lot of people love the opening ayat of Surah Al-Mu'minun. Why? Because you have the criteria of success that lead to the highest levels of Jannah. Qad aflah al-Mu'minun. The believers have already succeeded, meaning it's a guarantee. If you're a believer, you will succeed. Who are they? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us six characteristics of those believers. And of the six, two of those six 
have to deal with prayer. Two of the six are about salah. The very first one and the very last one. It's sandwiched, subhanAllah, everything in between. The very first one is what? الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ They are those who when they pray, they are humbly submissive. They are focused. They are trying their best to be mindful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the very last characteristic that also deals with salah is what? وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَى صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ They are those who guard their prayers. A lot of scholars commented, what's the difference in tafsir? What's the difference between these two? Those who guard their prayers, a lot of scholars say, they guard them in terms of their time. They guard them in terms of praying on time. You have a beginning and end time for every salah, you guard it. And the second is in terms of the actual quality of the salah, the presence now of the prayer. Think about that. The Prophet ﷺ one time was asked, of all the acts of worship, by the way, there are so many ahadith, they're all authentic, of different people who came to the Prophet ﷺ asking him about the best of deeds. And he gave, the responses were not always the same, he gave many different responses. So many scholars say these are amongst the best of deeds. This is why if, if you were to collect, uh, I was talking to one of uh, our colleagues about this, collect all the ahadith about khayrukum or khayarukum or the best of actions, ahsan, you'll find these specific words that are used, you will, or afdal, you will find that oftentimes they are diverse. So you can find 50 different acts of worship that are considered amongst the best of acts of worship. And sometimes the advice would be tailored to the one who is asking. Somebody who came and asked for advice, the Prophet ﷺ knows this man struggles with anger. He's very, very, very short-tempered. So the Prophet ﷺ gave him advice, لا تغضب. Don't, don't allow your anger to control you. Three times repeated it for this man. But in another hadith, he gave somebody else very different advice. So it's sometimes tailored to the one who is asking you for nasiha. In this report of uh, Ibn Hibban, it is an authentic hadith. A man comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an afdal al-a'mal. He asked him about the best of deeds. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, The prayer, the best of deeds, as-salah. And then he asked, what's after that? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ثُمَّ الصلاة, prayer. After that, three times he said salah before he mentioned jihad. And another hadith, the best of actions, salatu ala waqtiha, prayer at its due time. These are both authentic narrations. In other words, the prayer, the prayer, the prayer. The third blessing or virtue, every time you pray, your sins are being erased. And who amongst us does not want to leave this world with as clean of a slate as possible? Who amongst us would not think and wish that when I pray my last prayer, we don't know if we just prayed it, Salat al-Maghrib. We don't know if tonight when we pray Isha, this will be the last Salat. We don't know, but every Muslim before us had a final prayer. Wouldn't we hope that because we were attentive, we gave it its time, its right, that our sins, more of our sins are erased? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمَ يُصَلِّ وَخَطَايَاهُ مَرْفُوعَةٌ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِهِ كُلَّمَا سَجَدَ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, as reported by Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anh, the believer, the Muslim, when he prays, his sins are marfu'ah, it's like hanging above your head. We don't know how, we don't know in what way, above one's head. And every time he prostrates, some of them will fall. Some of these sins will fall. So every time you do sujood, this is why you don't fly through your sujood. This is why you take your time in sujood. The Prophet ﷺ, he told us, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُنُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدٌ فَأَكْثِرُ الدُّعَى The closest a servant is to his Lord is in prostration. When your head is on the ground in the lowest position, it is the most humbling physical position, but is the highest uh, spiritual status. And now your dua is even more accepted, more receptive in terms of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From salah to salah, as salatul khams wal jumu'ah ila al jumu'ah. From salah to salah, your sins are being erased so long as you don't fall into the major sins. In that case, you would need to do tawbah. In that case, you need to repent. Number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa during al Isra wal Mi'raj to the heavens. We know the story, it's a long story, long narration. He brought him up and gave him specific prescriptions. For example, one of the gifts given during Al-Isra' wal Mi'raj is verses of the Qur'an. Which verses of the Qur'an? The last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, Khawatim Surah Al-Baqarah. These were given during Al-Isra' wal Mi'raj. These are verses you should recite every single night and teach your children to recite. The Prophet said they suffice you all night. So with that prescription, there was another thing that happened, which is Salah, 50 prayers. And then 40 prayers. You know the narration, Musa alayhi salam told him, go back and ask because your people will not be able to handle it. 30 prayers, 20 prayers, 10 prayers, 5 prayers. And even then Musa alayhi salam, when the Prophet ﷺ came back uh, on his level, the sixth heaven, he said, go back for even that is too much. Go back and ask for another reduction. He said, I felt too shy from my Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed five prayers with the reward of 50. 
And sometimes people ask, why did it start with 50? Why, was it, why did all of this happen? Why were we told about it? There's a wisdom and a mercy for anything that we know about revelation, about prescriptions, about morality. Because morality, all of it, what's good and bad, the obligatory and the prohibited, it's good for us. Even if we don't know the wisdom behind it. One of the many wisdoms is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind us that of His mercy is that He could have prescribed 50 prayers, all of which would be obligatory. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduced it, reduced it, reduced it physically, but the reward stayed the same. So it is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you pray five prayers, but it's like the reward of 50. This doesn't mean you pray one salah, you're like, I'm done for the day because I got the reward. Now you pray five prayers, but it's as though you're fulfilling that reward. Of course, the acts of worship are multiplied. And you know what's amazing about this? Sometimes people complain about salah being a burden. And I, I just want to ask, can anyone estimate for us how long does a raka'ah take? What would you guess? A minute? Around a minute. Around a minute. Anybody here time it before? Yes? It's around a minute. You start praying. I don't want to use up an entire minute for this. But if you started to pray, somebody complains, salah takes up so much time. You start praying, Allahu Akbar, I am at the 30 second mark. You, let's say you add some of the sunan, opening dua. And you read Surah Al-Fatiha. You take your time with it. You read a short surah or some ayat. Now obviously, the more you can read, the better for you. You go into ruku'ah. You repeat the same dhikr three times. Maybe you add a new dhikr as well. Allah that You say a dhikr, dua. You go into sujood or praise rather. Sujood, take your time with it. You made a dua, subhanahu wa ta'ala three times. Then you made dua for something. Guidance, forgiveness, purification of your heart, your parents, something. You do this again, another sajda. You're done with the raka'ah. It didn't even take a minute. Now obviously, the longer you recite, the longer it could take. The longer you take in sujood, the longer the raka'ah. But is salah really a burden physically? No, it's not. We get up and do all types of things when we're motivated, when there's value. One brother said, when, it was, when he felt like it was the end of his life, he said, I felt like it was so ridiculous how I tricked myself when I was young. And I used to say salah is difficult. He said, now if Malakul Maut came to me right, right now, and I had the ability like, to stand and pray, I'd be like, this is the easiest thing to do, stand and start praying. What is that? Is it really difficult or do we make it difficult sometimes? Salah is a liberation for us. It's healing for us if we realized what it was. It's a conversation with Allah. Number five, salah protects us. If you pray with khushu' and you made dua in salah, it could be the reason you were less tempted to a sin or you were protected from something that could open the door to a sin. This is one of the meanings of inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. But if you don't pray with any quality prayer and you're not making dua to be protected from sin and you're not asking Allah for forgiveness sincerely with focus, then it's possible that someone is praying five prayers and still committing openly a lot of major sins. Because they're not praying the prayer that's supposed to heal and protect from sinfulness properly. Number six, salah is a light, a nur. In this life, in terms of guidance, in terms of the internal state of light. And of course, uh, many people know that on the day of judgment, crossing over the sirat, we mentioned uh, this in one of the previous lectures, uh, that some of the things that will light the path, one of them is iman. Another is salah. Why? Prophet ﷺ said, Give glad tidings, Bashir al Mashain, give glad tidings to those who walk where in the darkness of the night, meaning Salat al Isha, Salat al Fajr. You're waking up, you're taking the time, you're sacrificing energy. Yes, you have work, you have family, you have school. You made time. This is a way of life. This is what I was created for. You told yourself this is more important. So you went out for Salah in the darkness of the night. Yes, Alhamdulillah, we have electricity in our times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees that you will have light on the day of judgment. Why? Because you did an act of worship that was sincere. And generally at that time especially, nobody knew who was praying in the masjid. Nobody knew who is the person next to them. Munafiqeen would not show up. It was the most difficult prayer for them. May Allah keep us sincere and consistent. Number seven is that prayer. When it's done right, if you were, for example, in one sajda, as one brother said, he said one sajda changed his life. One sajda, that he, the first salah he started to pray after several years. He started to cry with a lot of remorse, a lot of regret, a lot of gratitude to Allah, mixed emotions. He said that one sajda changed my life. That was his turning point. He said, I wish I did that sajda before. I wish I did this three years ago. He had gone through something specific. How many times have we prayed with a sincere prayer, with focus, with a dua in your sujood or the, the recitation of Quran, and you felt the sweetness of faith? Number eight, when it's done right, Many scholars say salah can be a physical, uh, sorry, a psychological nourishment. 
a matter of resilience, that you find comfort and trust in Allah through the prayer. Why? Salah is a silah. You are linked to Allah. When you know Allah is with you, you are less afraid of worldly uncertainties. You have a little more confidence to move forward. You say in the salah sometimes, Hasmun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. You trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You make dua between the two sajdas. And there's a very special dua you can make according to a report from a Tirmidhi. رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَرْحَمْنِي وَهْدِنِي وَجِبُرْنِي وَعَافِنِي وَرْزُقْنِي In one riwayah, وَرْفَعْنِي So when you make these types of dua, these are all authentic, you find yourself with a little more confidence, a little more strength and resilience. Number nine, Salah is the first thing we'll be asked about on the Day of Judgment. How can we not prepare for that? It's an open book exam. And sometimes the professors that give us these open book exams are our favorite professors, right? You go home, you're like, this is the best class ever. I know exactly, there's no surprise. You don't have to memorize and cram, pull all-nighters for the last three, four weeks. You know exactly what you're being asked about. In this case, it's not even about memorizing. It's about doing. Knowing and doing, knowing and doing. This is the, the sign of faith. Number 10, salah can be a protection from evil. It is a uh, spiritual husn. So husn al-Muslim, when you talk about the protection of the believer through athkar, through dua, a lot of scholars say the one who prays has a fortress. If you pray your nawafil, you have another fortress. So as much as you pray with khushur, you will find in proportion to that, you will find the, the strength of the barrier around you from all types of harm. May Allah protect us all and keep us consistent. Number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps those who establish the salah. When he tells us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O believers, istainu bis sabri wa salah. Find resilience, seek help through what? Perseverance, patience, and prayer. They're combined together. In Allah ma'as sabirin. The rest of the passage is about those who died, is about the martyrs, is about the tests of life, the hardships that people go through. So the very foundation starts with istainu bil sabri wa salah. Prayer is one way to do that. You will find more support from Allah. In Allah yansurkum. If you give victory, if you give support, if you establish Islam and the rights of Allah, Allah will give you victory. This is one way for our ummah to succeed at large, but it starts with the individual. And number 11 and 12, the last two. Number 11 is, uh, it impact, sorry, number 12 is it impact our rizq. A lot of scholars say one source of barakah is that you take care of your prayer. Barakah in the sense that no matter how much money you can make without barakah, you will get so much more out of it when Allah blesses what you have. So that same hundred dollars, thousand dollars, million dollars, whatever it may be, there's more barakah in it. And one of the proofs they use is the ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالصَّبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Command your family to pray and be steadfast upon it. لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِزْقَ نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكَ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلتَّقْوَ Allah says, we do not ask you for rizq, rather we are the ones who provide for you. Meaning Allah is a razzaq. We in the royal sense, Allah provides. وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلتَّقْوَ Aqibah is the ending, the conclusion. The success ultimately is for those who have taqwa. It's for the people uh, who are al muttaqin and finally, the last blessing and virtue. Salah guarantees paradise. This is why one of the gates of Jannah is Bab al-Salah. One of the eight gates of Jannah. Jannah has eight gates and Hellfire has how many? Hellfire has how many gates? Seven. Hellfire has seven in Surah Al-Hijr. Laha sab'atu abwa. Likulli bab minhum juz'u maqsum. Paradise, according to authentic hadith, has eight gates. We know, for example, every Ramadan we hear and we talk about Bab al-Rayyan, those who fast will enter and no one else. There is according to authentic hadith, Bab al-Salah. The gate of Salah is for those who establish, establish their Salah properly. The five prayers. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us that no one prostrates for the sake of Allah except that Allah will record for this person one good deed and erase a sin and raise his status, meaning the status in the afterlife as well, by a degree, a daraja. So then he said, فَاسْتَكْثِرُوا مِنَ السُّجُودِ So increase your prostrations. Now one time there's a Sahabi, this is a beautiful story. He volunteered to help the Prophet ﷺ with some things. He volunteered, he helped him out. And then the Prophet ﷺ wanted to pay the man back for his time and his support. So he said, how can I repay you? And he said, أُرِيدُ مُرَافَقَتَكَ فِي الْجَنَّةِ I want to have your companionship in Jannah. Meaning, I want to be with you in paradise. They look at his standard. Like you want to be with the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. It's a high request. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, is there anything else that you want? Like maybe money, maybe something worldly. He said, Huwa that, that's all I want. So what did he say? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, then help me to help you with your request by increasing your sujood. Now you can't just increase your sujood on its own. It means increase your voluntary prayers. Pray a lot more prayers. Your status in Jannah will be raised. The next uh, reminder about the guarantee of Jannah. It's linked in a way. The Prophet 
He told us whoever recites Ayatul Kursi, whoever recites Ayatul Kursi after the written prayer, meaning the five prayers, nothing will prevent them from entering uh, Jannah except death, illa al maut. Except death meaning what? It's guaranteed, but sometimes people ask, well, all I have to do is read Ayatul Kursi five times a day? No. It means you're praying your five prayers on time. And you will not have the tawfiq, the blessing, the grace from Allah to even do this unless you are being sincere. So it's not going to come to someone who is not sincere with it. What else? Another reminder that is guaranteeing Jannah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man salla al bardaini dakhal al jannah. Whoever prays al bardain the two cool prayers, will enter paradise. As reported by Bukhari, the two cool prayers, the scholars say, Salat al Fajr and Salat al Asr. And these are referenced in the Quran as well. You have another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wrote upon his servants five prayers. Whoever comes with these prayers on the Day of Judgment and does not waste from them anything, Lam yudayya minhunna shay'an. Meaning you did not waste anything in terms of belittling the prayers. So you didn't come with three prayers a day. No, you came with five prayers. And you gave them their right. Bihaqqihin, you fulfilled their rights. The Prophet ﷺ said, كَانَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدٌ أَنْ يُدْخِلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ There's a guarantee you have with Allah that you will enter Jannah. And that's the fun part of the hadith, the glad tidings. What's the warning? The warning is right after this. He says, as for the one, who does not have the five prayers. As for the one who does not have these when they come on the Day of Judgment, There's no guarantee. If Allah wills, He will punish that person. And if He wills, He will enter them in Jannah. In other words, you leave their, their fate to Allah, but this person has no guarantee. This person has no guarantee. Who amongst us would not want a guarantee? Sometimes for a dunya, we will go to great lengths and measures to guarantee certain things. If you're on a trip, sometimes people like will do all types of things to guarantee something about the trip, something for your home. What about your children that you love? You'll go to great measures to guarantee certain things or try your best to guarantee. But what about the afterlife? This is a reminder for us. Another of the narrations about the guarantee of Jannah, the Prophet wasallam, he said, if any, Muslims perform, if any Muslim performs wudu properly and then stands and prays two rak'ahs, setting about them with his heart as well. Meaning the heart is present. مُقْبِلٌ عَلَيْهِمَا بِقَلْبِهِ وَوَجْهِ You're facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala figuratively and you have with you as well a mindful heart. إِلَّا وَجَبَتْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ Paradise is guaranteed for this person. Another hadith, whoever prays the 12 rak'ahs, the nawafin. These are, which nawafin? These are the rawatib, the ones tied to the obligatory prayer. Prophet Sallallahu described them in another report. In this particular report of Imam Muslim, whoever prays these 12 rak'ahs, other than the obligatory ones, in a day and a night, meaning to seek the pleasure of Allah, Allah will build for you a house in Jannah. إِلَّا بَنَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ In another riwayah, إِلَّا بُنِيَ لَهُ بَيْتٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ These are both authentic. So in other words, you're taking care of the five prayers and you're adding to it the nawafil as well. And there's another hadith, of course, uh, this is a famous hadith reported by Ibn Hibban and Al-Tabarani. Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam specified the reward for a woman. So he said, إِذَا صَلَّتِ الْمَرْأَةُ خَمْسَهَا If a woman, a Muslim woman, prays her five prayers, وَصَامَتْ شَهْرَ And she fasts her month, meaning the month of Ramadan. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued, and she guards her chastity, she obeys her husband, she will enter from any of the gates of Jannah that she wants. So there's even a specification in this hadith about reward for women as well. And there are many ayats that emphasize إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ To the end of the ayah. So emphasizing the, the spiritual rewards, the potential, the possibility for men and for women. And finally, this is a beautiful kind of ending hadith on the guarantee part here. There's a narration in which the Prophet wasallam he mentions that a group of angels, malaika, they come to you at certain times of the night, there's a shift, and others come at certain times of the day. And I will wrap up in the next uh, 10 minutes, inshallah, before our iqamah. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, these angels, imagine the shifts. This is why some scholars say there's always four malaika, two for the night and then two for the day. So these malaika, when the, the, the ones who are with you are leaving, they wait until the others arrive. So there is a certain time where there's an overlap, like a shift. I'm taking over your shift, in other words. So the malaika will come and they will take over this time. When do they have this overlap? At Fajr and at Asr. وَيَجْتَمِعُونَ فِي صَلَاةِ الْعَصْرِ وَصَلَاةِ الْفَجْرِ And when they meet at this time, Allah, uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, those who are with you, they ascend to the heaven, Allah asks those malaika, those who left their shift. They were with you for 12 hours, let's say. They left their shift and Allah asks them and He already knows. 
How did you leave my servants? Meaning, what were they doing when you were with them? كَيْفَ تَرَكْتُمْ عِبَادِي What were they doing? فَيَقُولُونَ تَرَكْنَاهُمْ وَهُمْ يُصَلُّونَ We left them while they were praying. Salat al-Asr or Salat al-Fajr. وَأَتَيْنَاهُمْ وَهُمْ يُصَلُّونَ And when we came to them for the next shift, they were also praying. So these malaika are taking shifts and you're in a state of Asr, a state of Fajr as well. There is a frightening and very scary hadith about some of the punishments of the grave. One of them is for those who know and they backbite, they backbite, they backbite. Another is about those who lie. Another is about those who um, uh, deal with riba or drink alcohol. There's a lot of examples. Zina, this is mentioned in one of the narrations. But there is one particular hadith in Bukhari. Prophet ﷺ described this person uh, that he saw in a particular type of punishment. That this person would take the Qur'an, so they knew Islam, but refused to act upon it. And he slept through the prescribed prayers. This person just skipped salah like it doesn't matter. Now, sometimes people hear this and say, what if I missed a prayer? I didn't mean to. This is not about the one who unintentionally missed the salah. There's no doubt regarding that. But the one who is taking salah very lightly, meaning they don't even set alarms. They'll set alarm for school. They'll set alarms for work. Sometimes people say, I can't make it to Fajr. They have a 7 a.m. flight. They're always on time for their flights. They have a job interview. They're always on time for job interview. They go to school. They're always on time for school. But then when it comes to salah, oh, yeah, I just, I, I missed it. We're not talking about the every now and then where there's like a real uh, sincere effort and Allah is aware of our intentions. This is why the intention is the very first thing that we covered. Uh, so there's an exception. Yes, if you missed it and you did tawbah and you made up the salah immediately, this is different. But the one who is knowingly, consistently, routinely missing the prescribed prayer, there's no excuse for that. This is for the one who's doing so intentionally. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us sincerity. Let's end on this note, uh, kind of a, a highlight and a very practical thing. We have seven minutes inshallah. I want to share five tips for us, to, to, as a reminder for myself and everyone here, five tips to improve our focus in prayer, our enjoyment of salah. Number one is, the, is something I mentioned at the very beginning. Change things up. Now, I don't mean the salah, but what you're doing in the salah. Change the routine. So if you are reading the same surah, memorize a different surah. Focus on these ayat and memorize, most importantly, learn the meanings of the ayat so you can enjoy the salah more. This will inspire us to learn more Arabic, to learn the tafsir, to memorize more surah, to have a friend call each other every week and read each other, with each other 10 minutes. There are many Qur'an programs, many teachers who do one-on-ones. There are teachers all over the world. We have Zoom these days. We have no excuse whatsoever. If you want to learn Arabic, you want to learn Qur'an, you want to spend just 10, 15 minutes starting from scratch, you can inshallah. And if you want to do more, an hour, two hours, you can do that inshallah. It's very, very doable. We've seen people start with pretty much no knowledge of Arabic, no knowledge of Quran. But they were consistent for one year. Now they enjoy their recitation. They've memorized the Quran. They're learning Tajweed. In fact, maybe some of them are even teaching and some of them have actually finished memorizing the Quran. So this is the, the advice of changing things up. Learn some new dua. Change the dua you're making in sujood. The second advice. And one of the most important, if you want to enjoy your salah more, take it slow. Slow down in salah. For some reason, a lot of times, people fly through the salah and simultaneously complain about salah. Like, I flew through the salah, but I felt nothing in salah. What were you, like, what did you expect? You, you weren't focused, you set things on your tongue, your mind was somewhere else. You didn't actually, like, you weren't there, you weren't present. And salah is, it's a reminder for us, you're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the greatest act of worship. This is the one that was prescribed as a daily act of worship. Fasting, once a year. And there are many exceptions for some people, they can't fast at the time, there's a chronic illness, so on and so forth. Salah, you have to pray even if you're in a war, even if you're in a battle. Yes, there's a different way to pray, but salah is so important that even if somebody is in the hospital, they're on the bed, they can't get up like many of our brothers and sisters and relatives. They would literally pray with basic movements or with their eyes. Salah cannot be missed. So take it slow in the prayer, invest in it. One of the, the best advices and the, the most simple, if you just slow down in your sujood, you will enjoy your salah more. It's a guarantee. The thing is, we don't always take this up, this offer. Slow down in your sujood, obviously the whole prayer, but especially in your sajda, you will enjoy the salah more. And when we say slow down, we don't mean saying like, subhan, no, no. Slow down and make a lot of dua. Breathe in and out, take your time. Prophet ﷺ described, and this is one of the pillars, arkan al-salah, is to have a, a stillness to your body. You're not allowed to actually fly through the salah where you're not stopping at all. You actually have to stop in every part of the salah. Your body has to be still in that new position. Breathe. You're, you're praying. Sometimes people rush and they pay so much money for meditation, for yoga, for other things. I'm not talking about halal and haram here. 
But they pay for all these other types of meditation and they breathe in and out. Like, oh my God, this is so liberating. You have salah that you pray five times a day without even the nawafin. Breathe in and out and call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you, you want, you, you won't be charged for it, like all these classes and programs. So take things slow. Number three of five, remind yourself, this is a, a reminder we all need, of the value of salah. Because sometimes we forget. There is an enemy out there who does not want you to enjoy your salah. The Prophet ﷺ told us about this. So when you are about to start salah, this is why you start with the dua and then a'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim. So you're trying to be protected so you can enjoy what's at stake here. The, the return on this investment. Number four, remember who you are conversing with. Who are you talking to? It is, it is so embarrassing for us to think about any time we had a shortcoming in salah. It's something that should make us sometimes feel guilty, not to the extent of paralysis, but rather productivity and growth. That in front of human beings, somebody's talking to you, a stranger, or somebody you consider to be important. Like for example, I don't know, I don't know how many people here have been part of uh, hiring committees in their universities, organizations, uh, their corporate places. You know, like who, who enters a room to be hired for a job they really want, and the entire time they're like looking around, like checking their phone, like, Oh, were you talking to me? Like, oh, I wasn't even paying attention to you. Like, who are you? Like, oh, I don't care. Nobody does that. I know this is a silly example. But with human beings, we don't do that. And even if it's not a job interview, a sign of respect when people are talking is that you, you listen to them. If you're not able to, you might say, I'm so sorry, just give me a minute. You'll do your thing and then focus. Actually, the Prophet Wasallam used to listen attentively. In Salah, you're talking to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. It is a conversation. Sometimes people ask, what do you mean conversation? It's one way. I'm praying. No, Allah is responding to you. You're making dua and Allah is responding to. And the best part of this, in fact, the crux of the entire salah, uh, not in terms of dua, in terms, in terms of the salah, is al-Fatiha. That's why no salah is valid without Surah al-Fatiha, the opening chapter, the greatest revelation given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says in the famous hadith Qudsi, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ قَسَمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نِصْفَيْنِ وَلِعَبْدِي مَا سَالِ I have divided the prayer in two, in, in two different halves between me and my servant, and my servant will get what they ask for. What are they asking for? فَإِذَا قَالَ الْعَبْدَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ When you recite Al-Fatiha with the Basman and you start الحمد لله رب العالمين قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ حَمَدَنِي عَبْدِي Allah responds. So if you think of just this reality that every time you're praying your recitation of Al-Fatiha is a conversation. Allah is responding to you. You praised Him. And you, you actually express not your praise. You didn't say أَحْمَدُ الله. You established a fact. That all praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Whether people and jinn do it or not, it is the reality. That all praise is due to Allah. When you say this, Allah says, Hamadani Abdi. When you, وَإِذَا قَالَ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ When you continue on with the next ayah, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ أَثْنَى عَلَيَّ عَبْدِي Allah responds and He says, My servant has glorified me. Mention me in a very uh, high manner. وَإِذَا قَالَ مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ When you continue with Surah Al-Fatiha, قَالَ مَجَّدَنِي عَبْدِي And in uh, one report, وَقَالَ مَرَّةً فَوَّضَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي When you say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord, the Master of the Day of Judgment, Allah remarks, My servant has glorified me. In another report, my servant entrusted his affairs to me. فَإِذَا قَالْ إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ The center of Al-Fatiha, the, the summary of Islam, the verse that summarizes everything for us, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, قَالَ هَذَا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي وَلِعَبْدِي مَا سَأَلْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this, this statement and this request is between me and my servant. My servant will receive what he asks for. Everything here builds up in this conversation to a dua, a request. What is the request? إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِينَ To the end of the surah. You're asking, Ya Allah, as you've guided me to pray and to be Muslim, Ya Allah, I'm begging you to keep me along the straight path. And this is why we ask for this type of hidayah. Because you're asking to stay strong when many people before us, perhaps here in the state, many people who recited Al-Fatiha before and they no longer recite it. May Allah protect us. Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deen. So you are conversing with Allah. Surah Al-Fatiha is a reminder that your salah is a conversation. So respect the one you are standing before. A sign of sincerity, a sign of respect, a sign of humility, a sign of gratitude is that you preserve your salah. And finally, the last reminder here, and we do have to stop for salah, inshaAllah. When you stand to pray, the Prophet ﷺ said, فَصَلِّ صَلَاةَ مُوَدِّعًا Pray as though you are bidding farewell. Salatul Al-Isha tonight, if you were to imagine this is my last salah, how would you pray? If somebody told you and someone put a gun to your head and said, hey, this is your last prayer, go ahead, I'll let you pray. How would you pray? You would have the most khushur in salah. Even if you don't understand, even if you came up with excuses before, you would have so much concentration in salah. This is one of the best advices. 
pray as though every prayer is your last prayer. And you will find yourself enjoying it more, slowing down, conversing with Allah, making more dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us consistent upon salah in guarding it and in khushur. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our children amongst those who establish salah as well with khushur and with iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to pray in private better than any of the prayers people see in public. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in establishing qiyamul layl and the nawafir throughout the day and night. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow our last prayer in this world to be the best of prayers and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our hisab on the day of judgment with that first question of salah the easiest of hisab so that everything that follows is easier may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live and die upon salah and to experience all of its fruits and all of its blessings and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for all of our shortcomings with prayer wa salli lahum ala nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een and we will see you all next week for the next part of our series inshallah ta'ala jazakum khairan